This is College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero, Jr., a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. Hello, everybody. Today for College Talk, we're going to talk about genes, genetics, heredity, things of which we always listen in the radio and watch on TV and uh, even movies that have been come up with genetic themes. And to talk about all those issues, we are going to talk to th today with uh, someone who is a specialist in genetics, Dr. Rebecca Spocconi, who is an native from uh, Brooklyn Heights here in New York City, and received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and her doctorate from the University of Arizona. And today is an assistant professor in the Department of Natural Sciences at the uh, Weizmann School of Arts and Sciences in Baruch College City, University of New York. Welcome to College Talk, Dr. Spocconi. Thank you very much. Uh, my first question that I always ask to all the guests who come here is, why do you become interested in your field? Why do you feel, at, at feel attracted towards genetics? So, it's not something that I think about a lot because it just seems like it's part of my everyday life now. <coughs> but I think that if I really think back, um, probably comes from when I was very little. Um, my parents, I mean, they always took us to the Natural History Museum, to the Bronx Zoo, um, and then even just watching on TV, we would pick the shows that are about science. And my mother, when she was an undergraduate, worked on fruit flies. Um, and even though she did not go on to work on science after she graduated from college, that still was important to her and she shared that with me. And I guess I incorporated that into who I am now and still am now. Okay, so I guess you didn't have the problem that other biologists had to had to deal with, which is to explain to the family why they were working in something like a fruit fly, or, <laughs> if, or for other biologists, mice or rats or things of that nature. Do you think that that family environment somehow help you to move forward in your career towards sciences? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think that that did help because my family was already interested in some degree to science, but even so, when I was going to college, they still were kind of trying to direct me in other directions. So they didn't say, oh, you should be a biologist, you know, but they, well, they left, you know, they left it up to me, but there was sort of this idea like, oh, maybe you should be an engineer or something like that. Um, so maybe this wasn't what, since neither of my parents actually work in biology, they don't really know exactly what it entails, although I guess they probably know a lot more now. <laughs> but before I decided to go on this route, I don't think they really knew, you know, what does a biologist do every day? Um, but I guess for me, I was fortunate in that I chose to go to an ag college. So like a historic land grant college that has an emphasis on biology overall in general. So basically any aspect of biology, um, from insects to plants to, you know, farming to genetics, cell biology, medicine, just every single topic was there. Um, and so that gave me the opportunity that if I wanted to switch my field that I could just pick something else. Yeah. Now, I'm a biologist myself, and I must recognize that sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with everything that's happened in genetics. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many things coming up every time. I mean, just uh, a year ago, I discovered this CRISPR uh, terminology and all that sort of things. So my question to you is, is even for geneticists difficult to keep up with <laughs> everything that's going on in your field? <laughs> yes, I would say for sure. Um, I mean, there, one of the beautiful things about using fruit flies or model organisms in general is that you can have all these tricks to manipulate 
fat organisms. And so anybody who's creative can come up with some like new method. So of course, it's very difficult to know every single method that is coming up. Um, of course, some of them are really, really useful. And then a lot of people find out about them, they win the Nobel Prize, and everyone knows about it. But, you know, if it's not such a popular one, there might be all these other tools available. Um, but again, in the fly community, at least, we're very lucky because most people are very nice and they want to help each other and actually if they create a new method or a new tool to manipulate the genetics, then they will be willing to share it with you. So there's stock centers where everybody puts their um, new flies that they made and anybody from the community can get it. Um, and there's places where you can get pieces of DNA that someone constructed and share them um, and methods and you know they'll invite you to their lab so you can learn how to do it. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be part of that community where this aspect of sharing the information so that science can move forward is a big part of, of the science, yeah. One of the areas in which you have been working is the relationship between genes and hormones. And that's something a lot of people don't make the connection about, but maybe you want to explain to our audience why that connection is so important. Oh, so... It is very important. Um, one thing that the general audience might be more familiar with is um, hormones like estrogen, for instance. So the way that estrogen works is it is a small molecule that can go around the body. And then when it gets to a cell that it might have an effect on, there's something called a nuclear receptor. So the nuclear receptor is a kind of protein that binds to hormones, but then also can go into the nucleus and control the DNA. So this type of protein is found across all organisms, um, and it in can synthesize the relationship outside the cell to inside the cell of what hormones are there. And so that's why something like estrogen can have an effect in all different parts of the body, right? So, um, and this is why when you have drugs against uh, estrogen, it can also have effects in different parts of the body. So I'm studying that in the flies, um, how insect hormones are affecting different tissues all over the body. Yeah. To what extent, people may ask now, what you can learn by studying a fruit fly can have an application in medicine for humans? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, these family of proteins, the nuclear receptors, are uh, related, and some of those proteins are also found in the fly that are found in the human. And so if we can figure out how they work in the flies, then that can give us a better idea of how they can work in the human, right? So one of the big questions is, how do you have the same signal with the same receptor that has different effects in different tissues? So when you do studies on humans, you're usually just using cells that are separated from an organism in a dish, right? So you can't ask a question of how is this affecting all these different tissues at once inside of an entire animal. Whereas with the flies, we can do that. So I can look at different parts of the animal um, with the same stimulus or the same genetic background at the same time, as opposed to separating them out and having this very artificial environment in the yeah. dish. Yeah. And I don't think most people realize how many things we shared with many animals, including fruit flies, although we are quite different from a <laughs> morphological <laughs> viewpoint, but the basic structure, the basic chemistry is in many ways the same, uh, and beginning with DNA itself. I mean, this is a universal thing that we're, we're going to find among living organisms. Absolutely. Um, and with all of these systems, you have the hormone, then it binds to the protein, and then that protein is going to bind to potentially thousands of places in the DNA, and that's also the same between organisms. Of course, humans have more DNA 
and flies, and so their nuclear receptors are going to bind to more places. But overall, it's the same idea that it's going to go all over the DNA, but in these different tissues, it might be different parts of the DNA. Sure. Yeah. Now, when I asked you earlier if it's difficult to keep up with all the, the new things going on in genetics, you told me even, even for geneticists it's difficult <laughs> to do that. But I suspect somehow in your community of scientists, uh, people have a kind of consensus about where genetics is going as a science and what may be the big discoveries that are about to be made in the next few years. Can you give us a preview <laughs> of those thoughts? Um, I mean, one big push right now is this idea of precision medicine, um, which is tailoring, right, your medical care or your drugs to yourself, right? And this is because the cost of sequencing DNA has gone down dramatically. Um, and so, you know, you could get your whole genome sequenced for, I think, you know, we're talking about $1,000, possibly less than that now. Um, and so if you know every piece of DNA that you have, then you can say, okay, do I have the proteins that will be able to utilize these certain drugs or not? Because some people, they take a drug and their body can't use it at all, so that drug won't affect them. So in that case, it would, you would say, oh, don't take that drug because it won't help you, right? Or it can help you to know what dose of a drug to take or something like that. So that's sort of where we're moving. But in the meantime, making those associations and making those predictions is still pretty rough. So you can get the information, but interpreting the information is still going to take some time. Um, so the utilization utilization of the data is uh, sort of lagging behind the ability to generate the data. Um, but there's many people working on this, and they seem like they're making some headway, so yeah. I think it will go forward faster. And you, know, you, you mentioned that the sequencing has become much cheaper. I mean, now we see a lot of commercial services that basically will uh, uh, give you your sequence mm -hmm. uh, with just a few drops of your saliva for $99. Yeah. Uh, and actually people are doing that because they find a lot of interesting things in terms of their ancestry when it comes mm -hmm. to the genetic uh, 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 tree in that way. So based upon what you're saying, this is a maybe a crazy idea, but maybe in the future there won't be generics anymore, but actually your doctor will say, based on your um, uh, sequence of DNA, will say, well, you need this, this specific thing, and then we'll call the pharmacy, and the pharmacy will produce <laughs> that a specific medication for you that will be effective, and probably also with m much less risk of having secondary effects, right. which is all what we hear in this commercial about uh, medicine that says, you, if you take this, you you will be cured for that, but you <laughs> might die, you may <laughs> have cancer, you may <laughs> have you know, right. all, 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 all different things. So that will be also that will be avoided with this, let's call, let's call uh, tailor-made medicines, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's the other thing. It might work for you, but some people might have more sensitivity to have worse side effects than others. And so yeah. for you, it might not be worth it to take that because you're going to have a worse reaction than someone else. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think what you're suggesting is potentially even the next layer of that where, like, changing the synthesis of the medicine to the individual person. So I'm not a chemist, but that does seem like that would be great. I don't know anything about that, <laughs> um, but that could potentially be a good idea. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. I heard your talk at the Natural Sciences Department this week when you were talking about how um, you got your ancestry done with yeah. the 23, was with 23 ME? Yeah. Um, and I did it too. Mm -hmm. And mine was <laughs> really boring. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, I mean, it can be very interesting. Yes. Um, 
Or mine was like, you're Ash, you know, you're ninety eight percent Ashkenazi. I was like, oh yes, well, I already knew that. So <laughs> like, no, mine was all over the place, <laughs> all over the, the world map. Yeah, yes. so it's a little more exciting when you yeah. find out something new about yes. yourself. Yeah. I guess. I mean, maybe it's comforting when you get affirmation of something you thought you already knew. Yeah. Um, but it's a little like less <laughs> exciting when you're like. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. I'm okay. pretty sure of that. Um. Something I noticed by reading your resume is that you work extensively with undergraduate students. I mean, to work with graduate students is no brainer. Everybody does that. But to work with undergraduate students, not everybody does that. And I was wondering uh, why you felt so inclined to include undergraduate students in your own research. Um, I think. That's always been important to me. And actually, I guess, even from the very beginning, I mean, my mom did undergraduate research with flies. Um, even when I was in junior high, you know, I did the science fair project. We had flies in the basement. Um, and doing research yourself just doing anything yourself is such a better way to learn about things. I mean, when I was a student learning about these things, it's hard to grasp all of these con concepts. You know, it's hard to really imagine what's going on. But when you're doing it, when you're actually working with the flies, when you're actually working with whatever material, then why you need to know these certain pieces of information makes a lot more sense because, oh, you need to know this in order to do the experiment, in order to interpret the results. You know, so I just, I think that the hands-on is critical for... Oh, uh, don't worry about that. Motion, oh. se motion sensor. <laughs> <laughs> Not <both> here. Yeah. <laughs> need to be moving around more. Um, so, yeah, so doing it yourself is just a much better way to learn anything. Yeah. Um, uh, and then on the, the other thing is I kind of chose a research topic that is accessible and, you know, you can do, anybody can do these experiments. And so um, I think you can get more done that way. Really, the trick is, you know, you want to ask the good questions, but you want the technique to be straightforward and simple, right? You don't mm -hmm. need a fancy technique. You need a you know, a good question that you yeah. can answer. Okay. Do you feel that by doing that, not only the students are learning things that they wouldn't learn or they would probably forget if you just mm -hmm. memorize, but also they create in them a sense of how science works. What is the scientific methodology, the scientific approach to problems? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, then you can see, okay, here's the question. What's the approach? What are we going to do to answer it? And then you can see, you know, sometimes the technique fails, so you don't get an answer. Sometimes the hypothesis is wrong, so your results are not what you expected, right? So then you have to go through and say, all right, well, why was the hypothesis wrong? So now we have to make a new hypothesis and then do a new experiment. So then they will definitely see that um, as we go through. And they also learn to interpret their results um, and to think about what it means and to share the results with other people. Um, and all of those things are critical to learning and also critical to the scientific process. <coughs> Um, I think that's also fun, I guess, to mm -hmm. share your results. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, because uh, that's another thing. When you get these students involved in your research, you also give the opportunity to present their own yeah. results. And I think that's an, a, a, a way also to prepare them for a job because communication is also very important. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and, you know, <coughs> they always do a really great job. Um, I've been very impressed with the yeah. Baruch students. They present at the Biomed Club on campus um, and also Creative Inquiry Day. And then some of them have gone to some other like regional conferences. Um, and there's a McCub conference, which is Metropolitan Undergraduate Biologists. Mm -hmm. And they do a good job there. Um, 
And I had the opportunity to attend one of the sessions, the one that is international, but mm. being done via teleconferencing. And that has been a great, that has to be a great experience for them to see other students from other countries mm -hmm. participating, uh, looking how they do things, and at the same time uh, being asked questions by those students about their own research. Yeah, and I think that getting questions from people is incredibly important because that helps you, well, it helps you to see, you know, what points am I getting across well, what questions are coming up, and then also can give you suggestions of what to do next, you know, mm -hmm. what would be a good place to go with this research. Um, so getting feedback is also an important part of doing research, yeah. Now, when you teach gen genetics, I'm sure you get a lot of questions from the students because genetics, genes, heredity is on the news almost every day. And do you, do you feel you're getting a flow of questions that have to do with the ethics of genetic manipulations, the so-called um, prefabricated babies that mm. people decide how they want the babies to look like and those, 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 those sort of things. So my question to you is, do you think that today's uh, students of genetics are concerned or interested in issues of ethics? Um, I think they are. I don't talk about that that much with my development students, but I did talk about it more um, with my Macaulay students because we were talking about the commercialization of genomics. Like we were talking about before, you can get things sequenced and then you can you know, pay for services and do these various things. Um, and it was interesting because now that CRISPR is in the news, so we talked about that. And so CRISPR, if you're not aware, audience, um, is where you can actually go in and make specific changes to DNA in a live organism. And so you could potentially change someone's gene from what it would have been to something else in an early embryo and change what the adult was going to be. So we did talk about that a little bit. And the students were very concerned um, because, and it was interesting, because they were concerned that if we were able to fix everybody's genetic diseases, then we would have overpopulation. So that's what they were worried about, <laughs> which was surprising to me. But I think that might more stem from maybe a little bit of over um, too much faith that, that this is going to fix all the problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that even if we had the ability to change whatever gene we want, we still don't know which genes you would need to change in order to get, you know, these super long life and full health. Because not all diseases are because of genetic disorders, right? Um, and we also don't know the basis of all the genetic disorders. So yes, that might be a problem, but but I don't think that's going to be the main problem. And the other thing is, just because you can change one gene with CRISPR doesn't mean you can change 2,000 genes in the same embryo, yeah. right? So your chance of success with every change you want to make goes down dramatically. And then you also start running the risk that you're going to accidentally introduce other changes that you don't mean to have. Yeah. So. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, I think their ethical issues might be different from some other people's ethical issues of just, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this at all in humans. Um, and that is being debated um, worldwide. Again, I study flies so that I don't have to deal with any of these <laughs> ethical <laughs> issues. Um, <Yeah>. But... <laughs> but Clearly, you know, this is Delta. coming, yeah. so yeah. we can't really avoid it forever, yeah. Well, I'm old enough to remember <coughs> when the first in vitro fertilization mm. took place. That was a big brouhaha. Yeah. And nobody talks about that from an ethical viewpoint these days anymore. It's like, okay, it's happening, and that's not a big discussion. Yeah. Do you feel that <coughs> as society evolves, 
Some of our ethical concerns regarding genetics are going to be changing and uh, even forgotten. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a really good point. Like, that was, you know, a big topic. Everyone was talking about it. Mm -hmm. We weren't sure if this would be a good thing or not. And I think the general consensus these days is that that's a great thing, you know? Like, people can have babies and maybe they wouldn't be able to otherwise, and then that's wonderful for them. Um, so that's considered to be very positive, right? And then when I was graduating college was the first time there was any cloning mm -hmm. where you just took the whole DNA from one organism and then make another individual, right? Yeah. And that was a huge ethical right, issue. Yeah. Was. And that was without changing the DNA. Yes. And now these days, again, like this is also commercialized. Like you can potentially clone your dog or whatever. So, I mean, with the caveats that it might take a lot in order to be successful, but that this is much less controversial than it was 20 years ago, you know? Um, so we'll see. I mean, in my mind, CRISPRing a human embryo is still pretty controversial, but, you know, maybe since the speed of all these things has increased so much, maybe it won't be controversial yeah. for very long. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my last question for you is, what is your next big project? What you are cooking right now in your lab that you may say, this is going to be something really important for me in the years to come? Um, so right now I've just started on a project to look at um, how genetic variation between different flies will affect their sensitivity to a specific hormone. Um, and so that project is kind of based on the idea that we were talking about before of how does genetic variation affect individual sensitivity to different drugs. So in this case, the hormone that I'm using is a hormone mimic that is used as a pesticide. Um, it acts like a hormone called juvenile hormone in insects. Um, and it keeps them in a juvenile state or it inhibits them from becoming adults. And so the question is, you know, even in natural populations, there's going to be differences in the genotype that will make them more or less sensitive to the hormone. And that will allow us to find out what genes are important for the hormone to work normally and abnormally. And hopefully we'll start finding some of those tissue-specific genes that affect sensitivity to hormone. And how do you get tissue-specific results? Because some tissues don't respond to the hormone at all, and then some will have cell division, some will have cell death, and some will have cell movement. So what is turning on in all of those tissues that causes those changes? And then you can bring that back to other systems like why when you have an estrogen treatment in humans, right, that can either um, help with curing a disease or it could potentially cause a disease, right? And so what other proteins are in those cells that are causing them to divide or to, um, to die? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Spocconi, about this very interesting conversation about genes, genetics, heredity, and many other things. And next week, uh, we're going to have another interesting chapter of College Talk. So stay tuned. This has been College Talk with Dean Aldemaro Romero Jr., a production of the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch College. All rights reserved, 2017.